The forthcoming 2023 elections, the truths about the character of the late Chief Ernest Shonekoy and more. Amoy Ali Shore joins to discuss these and other issues. And in an article titled, What is Nigeria's Government for? The Financial Times questions the Nigerian system and its government. This is Plus Politics and I am Justin Akadonye. Presidential aspirant Omoya Shore has popped in and out of the news several times over the past few months. The latest that was heard from him was his description as dead on arrival, the presidential ambitions of former governor of Lagos State and chieftain of the All Progressives Congress, Bola Tinubu, Vice President Yemi Oshibajo, and former governor of Anambra State, Peter Obi. In his New Year's message, Shoare has called on Nigerians to resist any attempt to succumb to the antiques of the President Mohamed Buhari-led government, adding that the party will liberate and rescue Nigerians from poverty and hardship created by the regime. He also described the late Ernest Shoneko as a traitor and not a leader as many claimed he was. He now joins us to discuss all of this and much more. Good evening to you, Omoya Lishore. Many thanks for joining us in Plus Politics. Thanks for bringing me. All right, let's talk about um, the race uh, to who governs the missionary of government come 2023. This actually is actually heating up, and lots of people have indicated interest. Others are pushing other names forward. But let's talk about uh, uh, your description of uh, some people who have uh, shown um, interest. Uh, that's uh, the former governor of Lagos and the chieftain of the All Progressives Congress, uh, Bola Ahmed Jinnabu, also the vice president, Professor Yemi Shibajo, and uh, Peter Obi. You have described your ambitions as dead on arrival. How is this so? Oh, well, uh, with regards to the former governor of Lagos State, well, uh, met Nubu. Uh, it's very obvious that uh, he was just testing waters. Uh, he's not widely accepted by Nigerians, and um, this is as a result of his records. As uh, uh, in addition to the fact that he's very frail, sick, and uh, one of the politicians that are tired and put Nigeria where it is today. So. I'm speaking to these ambitions based on what we're hearing from the streets that Nigerians no longer want people who fail them. And the same thing applies to uh, the vice president, Yemi Shibadu, who I described as a coward, who was vice president to President uh, Muhammadu Buhari for almost eight years now. Uh, this is the uh, uh, last year in office. And under his regime, the violations of human rights, uh, the economy tanks, insecurities, uh, uh, almost uh, they've lost almost uh, every battle in, this, uh, in the security arena. And for some such a person to come and say he wants to be president, what is he going to tell us? Uh, would he say this would be continuity? Or would he tell us that uh, his hands are tied, as uh, his supporters and minions like to tell people? Uh, of course, this will not happen, and uh, people are, have rejected their candidacy. And they, you, as you could tell, their candidacy fizzled out as soon as uh, they came on board. And um, with regards to Peter B, <coughs> it's uh, candidate show is based on complete sentiment. But uh, what, what I said, which I stand by or stand with, is that he's one of the failed corrupt politicians that govern the state. Uh, they have nothing to show for their governance of such as just as Tinubu was the governor of Lagos State and Lagos State did not improve in any any way. The same way Peter Abi governed Anambra State. He's a very divisive figure, by the way. He was one of the people who uh, removed people they call beggars from Anambra State and returned them to wherever he thought he claimed was their state, which is. Uh, naturally against uh, the constitution of their own constitution uh, of Nigeria. He was also accused of embezzlement of funds 
at the point she was moving her phones out of Anambra State and the police intercepted about 215 million naira. They said he takes out of Anambra State every weekend to his papa office. So uh, I don't see how someone who cannot point to any record of uh, development while he was going up for eight years to come and sentimentally uh, try appealing to people that he, if he becomes the president of Nigeria, he will be a better person. So that's those are I'm dealing with those who have come out. Uh, this is not to, in any way, say that I have any sympathy for candidates uh, who are planning to run for. Office. As they come out, I uh, will continue to provide the analysis. But what we're saying categorically is that it is the turn of uh, credible Nigerians to be president or to preside over the affairs of the country called Nigeria. All right, uh, let me just take you back to one of the things uh, you just said in your opening salvo. You said um, these candidates, that these are the, the APC chieftain, uh, Bola Tinubu, the vice president, Professor Yemi Oshibadru, and the former governor of uh, Anambra State, Peter Obi. You said they, uh, they, are, they have not been accepted by Nigerians. Uh, what yardstick uh, did you use to come uh, to this conclusion? Well, um, <clears throat> I, I, I talked to a lot of people. Uh, we, I also, I'm, I'm a junkie politically. Uh, I don't need to tell you that. So, which means I listen to a lot of channels, especially among uh, young people who want to see Nigeria move in a different direction from where it has been in the last 60 years. And the proponents of opinion is that uh, these failed positions are no longer acceptable. And also that their platforms, the party platforms they are operating on, uh, PDP and APC, are not acceptable to majority of Nigerians. These are political parties that have failed Nigerians uh, repeatedly, uh, both at local, state, and uh, federal levels. And, uh, Nigerians are saying it categorically that they don't want these political parties or the operatives <coughs> or their leaders or um, you know uh, uh, members to have anything to do with their future, especially at the presidential level. All right, fine. You have mentioned the party platforms that they are running. That's the APC and um, the PDP. Uh, you also um, urged Nigerians uh, not to give up, saying that the AAC will rescue you know, the country from um, these uh, greedy politicians. Uh, that's the way you actually captioned that. Um, so let's talk about the acceptability of the AAC. How do you see Nigerians accepting the AAC come 2023? <coughs> the... Uh, African National Congress, which is a party that we formed in 2018, is a brand new party uh, who, and a party that's now been around for about, uh, I would say, between, I mean, for three years practically, and uh, has the most acceptable ma manifesto uh, that will turn around the fortune of Nigeria. And when we were campaigning in 2018 and 2019 on our manifesto, some people thought we were joking, but it turns out that the bigger political parties, the, well, I won't say bigger, but legacy parties as they call them, were listening on uh, our manifestos and stealing our ideas. Um, it was from us that uh, the idea of minimum wage came about. When they implemented it, it was done uh, not in a way that suits the, the interests of uh, workers. It was from us that the idea of uh, making June 12th Democracy Day came out. Uh, it was a pronouncement we made in Abel Kuta. It was from us that, uh, uh, you know, the issue of diversification or creating multiplicity of electrical <coughs> electricity uh, sources was uh, sold to Nigerians. It was from us that, that even the most uh, taunted uh, marijuana uh, exports agenda uh, was brought to Nigeria, and then a few years later, every country is adopting it now. And from what I heard, the National Assembly is debating it now as well. It was uh, also from us that the idea of uh, uh, cutting costs at National Assembly came about. We proposed at that time that Nigeria doesn't need a bicameral legislative system that will be good enough. We have a unicameral legislative system that's representative enough. And now, a lot of people have also uh, uh, lashed on to that. So, 
several other things that are available on our website, aacparty.org. And we traveled around this country, 34 states, about 34 states and the federal capital territory. And we did town meetings and campaigned everywhere. We didn't have a private jet, we didn't have godfathers. We also, uh, first time in the history of Nigeria, did raise funds, um, crowd, true crowd uh, funding, uh, which is now something that some of them are embracing. So, and for the first time also in the history of Nigeria, where we were done with elections, we did publish our uh, election accounts. So public, it was made public, and it's still available online to today. So that party, the AAC, is the party that can take Nigeria to that level uh, that will make Nigeria the pride of uh, all nations, both on the continent of Africa and the world. And we've also described how extensively we can resolve the problem of unemployment, turn around the Nigerian economy, fight corruption, you know, fund education appropriately, you know, uh, put in place a world-class health care system, and uh, use technology as a background for uh, taking care of all the issues that uh, we have I've described to you since I started talking about the party. So. <clears throat> The question that most journalists ask is, where are your structures? Uh, but my answer is very simple. The legacy parties that you talk about all the time, you give your airtime to, they don't have any structure. They just have transactional partners, criminal transactional partners, so which they pass on funds and they buy votes, uh, bribe the police, security agencies, uh, professors in universities who are hired by NEC. And they write results, and these results, uh, when they are contested in courtrooms, they bribe judges, and they load themselves of ours, and we're saying that will, our party will bring an end to that. All right. Let's still talk about, um, you know, the legislation for which um, the 2023 election should actually, you know, you know, be done. That's the Electoral Act Amendment, which is still, you know, uh, having uh, some back and forth as it is. Uh, let me get your candid opinion concerning this in new Electoral Act. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, what uh, loopholes, uh, if there are any? Uh, how do you really see it? What we really need right now? You know, I, I would tell you that there's never a time the electoral acts of law has ever determined the outcome of an election. So I don't know why people waste too much of their time uh, discussing the electoral acts, whether it's signed to law or not. The people who want to steal elections, want to hijack the political space, don't care about your electoral laws. What people should worry about are those characters who have... Uh, now populated INEC, that is the Independent National Electoral Commission, uh, who are members of uh, the APC, the All Progressive uh, Congress. Uh, uh, and that's something that nobody's paying attention to, that a lot of commissioners, national commissioners were recently approved by the Senate uh, or National Assembly, who ordinarily should not be allowed near free and fair election. Some of them, we found and placed their, uh, their voters' cards or membership cards, and they're members of the ruling party. So those are the things we should worry about. Uh, with regards to the electoral laws, well, you know, I do not care too much about those laws as much as I care about uh, the human resources that are going to conduct elections. And I think as it is presently composed, it's made of, made of people who do not have the credibility to conduct free and fair elections. All right, uh, let's talk... Okay, let's talk about the state of the nation. Let me just quote you um, verbatim. You said that in this year, 2022, uh, the, uh, the year will be awash with a lot of uh, neoliberal attacks. A democratic right will be violated more by the state, and the civil state would continue to shrink. I need you to throw more light on that. You know, I'll give you an example. Uh, nobody thought in that in 2021, Twitter will be banned in Nigeria, and it's become this. You know, it's become one of uh, the major indicators of how vibrant the civil space is, and I see more of that happening. In fact, in 2022, 
if the government can't cope with uh, the vibrancy of uh, you know, uh, civilians in the country, when I mean civilians, the, well, I've seen people who are generally operating in the civil space, you will see them clamp down on more platforms. It won't be Twitter alone. Probably they'll go after Facebook. But they could even start shutting down uh, uh, mobile telephone companies or start targeting individuals, uh, hacking uh, into their mobile phones and ensuring that, you know, they don't have, we don't have that free will to communicate freely. You must have heard that this year, for the first time in the history of Nigeria, uh, my uh, national identity uh, number was deactivated. Yes. And as a result, I, I, and the bank account I needed to open couldn't be open. I used my INEC uh, card. It was also deactivated. They deactivated my passport. It wasn't until I threatened to sue them that they reactivated them. And I think probably they are doing it to a lot of people who are not aware already yet. So don't be surprised if you get to... Uh, I uh, to vote, I mean, to vote on elections, then they tell you your card is not working because it's been taxed because the government doesn't like you. Uh, but beyond that, we've noticed a lot of uh, clamp down on individuals, especially social media users, a bunch of people with tension, uh, people have been uh, arbitrarily uh, arrested. And you also have arbitrary uh, extrajudicial killing of protesters in the country. I was uh, shot at in uh, 2021, and I ended up in the hospital because a police officer targeted me at a protest, you know. Um, <clears throat> you know, my younger brother, my immediate younger brother was also killed in 2021. And as I'm speaking uh, with you today, nobody within the security agency have told us what happened. Uh, no one arrest made any arrest. And, you know, so <clears throat> that's not like the government is uh, desirous of ensuring that people are made to uh, they shut down the civil space and they will do whatever it takes to do that. I, I'm, I'm also referring to the ruling party because it, the, the APC supports this uh, sort of uh, violation of rights uh, without uh, any remorse. All right, let's talk about um, political participation vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the young people. You know, for the first time in, uh, in, in the history of Nigeria in 2020, the youth said uh, they were all in unison. They came out, you know, to protest against, uh, you know, police brutality, bad governance and all of that. But over time, we'll find out that uh, when it comes to election, uh, it's as though the youth uh, they do their activism more on social media on election day and uh, during election year, and we don't really get to see uh, much of the youth. How, how do you see that playing out in 2023? So <clears throat> a study was carried out uh, by a group of uh, election uh, monitors. And they found out that uh, people have progressively lost interest in the electoral process because it doesn't deliver the kind of results they expect. And uh, whereas in uh, 2015, uh, there were about the over 50, 70 percent participation in elections. As of the last uh, election cycle, it had depleted to 42 percent. So young people no longer find elections as avenues for electing desirable candidates. And they generally just stay away from elections. And what uh, NSAS uh, showed to us is that they weren't actually fighting against police brutality. They wanted to end uh, what had become a burden on them, which is what we call governance in Nigeria. And uh, the president of Nigeria, in one of his interviews, read that correctly, he said these guys wanted to come and chase us out of power because people have lost or have lost confidence in the electoral process. And uh, what you will see in 2023 is that there will be a true track engagement for young people. One is, is a number of them who still believe that democracy is not a bad idea, but there will also be a very solid group of young people who are waiting to see this 
politicians of the ruling uh, class make a mistake and they will just have no other option than to engage in, re in a revolution. And I have said it even before NSAS that a revolution is coming because people have lost uh, interest uh, and confidence in a democratic process that uh, Nigeria is practicing. Democracy is beautiful, but we are no longer practicing democracy in Nigeria. We are practicing what I've always consistently referred to as morontocracy, that is governments by morons for morons uh, in Nigeria. All right, uh, just last week, uh, the nation uh, buried um, one of um, its um, elder statesmen. Uh, uh, you seemingly have a, a different um, perspective, you know, to uh, his character. Um, speaking about uh, the late Chief Ernest Shoneko, you said uh, he was, um, he had actually some questionable character. You had some unsavory words to describe him. Why is that? Yeah. Well, I was uh, shocked when uh, he died and people were saying he was a great statesman. Uh, he was interim president of Nigeria. Yeah, and I think one of Nigeria's biggest problems is that we have very little memory uh, to the point that when despicable characters betray us, they stab us in the back, we forget too quickly and we think that when they die, uh, they are PR agents and standby to make them look good. I felt my voice as a person who was a student activist in the 90s when she went on uh, hijacked or was used to destroy Nigeria's democracy, both in 1992 and uh, finally in 1993, where he was illegally uh, appointed by, at that time, uh, General uh, Ibrahim Babangida, who fled Abuja because uh, he lost out in power. When, in fact, there was a, a winner of the election. MK Abiola, Mashud, Kashimawo, uh, Olawale Abiola was waiting uh, to, you know, assume the mantle of leadership. Having won the election, a credible, free and fair election. And um, uh, Chief Shunekon was a spoiler who came in and uh, accepted to be the interim president for 84 days before he was kicked out. Had he not played that role, Abiola would have been able to assume his legitimate position as president of Nigeria, and Nigeria would not probably be in the situation that it is today. So I was very shocked that uh, they were celebrating him. But after that intervention, uh, a lot of people started to realize that uh, he truly was a traitor. And I think finally when he was buried a few days ago, uh, the best way his burial could be announced was that uh, he was buried in a taxi million uh, naira casket or evolved somewhere in Lagos, and not because he was an uh, interim president. I hope one day um, the position of interim president or any presidential position that was ascribed to him will be scrapped. And whatever he was paid, uh, you know, either as a retirement entitlement will be taken back and given to the Abiola family who rightly deserve that. And this should serve as a notice to other people who have betrayed Nigeria. Not to think that when they die, we'll forget the role they played in destroying this country. I refer to the likes of Babangida, uh, even uh, Shibuluche Gumbasunjo, who was a two-time president uh, who acted uh, terribly uh, in eroding confidence in our democratic uh, space and process. All right, uh, just before we go, uh, the final question for you would be about um, the nation's, um, you know, unity, which has actually been threatened over time. It is a build up to the 2023 election, and we have been seeing all sorts of um, posts, all sorts of comments about um, who should, uh, or which region, the south and the north, you know, who is better, who is more qualified to rule the country. Uh, would you really say that all of these issues, our ethnicity has been a bane to the country, or is it that our politicians, uh, they've not be, really been able to unite the country as they should be doing, what with their talk of um, zoning and all of them, um, all of these issues that we get to hear every day? You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not interested in zoning. I hope that Nigeria would continue to search for competent Nigerians 
we can run this country effectively, efficiently, uh, in a in a just and egalitarian manner, um, so that these ethnic jingoists uh, will not have a say in how we run our lives. We have uh, done this whole rotational presidency for 20 years now. We've taken the presidents. Nigeria has taken the the ruling class has taken the presidents to, to as many places as possible. Uh, but what they, they have not taken the presidency to is the zone of competency, zone of justice, uh, zone of uh, men of integrity. Uh, so if we make the mistake again of zoning to another incompetent character simply because of uh, uh, the location of his village, well, you know, we will regret it. So I'm hoping that Nigerians, especially our young Nigerians, will not play into the hands of politicians who are asking for this ethnically, uh, you know, uh, uh, this ethnic propaganda about so I'm not interested in zoning. I just hope that Nigeria can once and for all have a president that is confident regardless of where he comes from, and someone who care about everybody, who care about humanity, not someone who care about his village or the size of uh, his church or mosque. All right, we must say a very big thank you to you, uh, Amor Yolishore, for joining us and, um, you know, bringing, um, you know, clarity to some of these great areas that uh, we have. I would do appreciate your time. Thank you so much for bringing me, and have a good day. Yeah, you too. All right, we'll take a short break now, and when we return, we'll discuss the Financial Times report and the government's response to it. More in a moment. Do join us again.